I have more of a class for you than maybe a lesson, but I am going to preach it nevertheless. And uh, this morning I'm really going to defend the original message of Christianity. You know, what was the original gospel message? What was the true OG? The original gospel! That's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's dive on into it, amen? You know, we all know that Jesus dies on a cross in Jerusalem. And um, there's so much ancient literature, as John kind of talked about, Josephus, Tacitus, the, Ta the Talmud, uh, many different pieces of ancient literature outside the Bible that records this happening. And so we know he dies on a cross in Jerusalem as a criminal. He then tells his guys, hey, go to Galilee, which really is about a four-day walk. So he says, hey, I, I want you to go back to Galilee to the place where we had our ministry together. I want you to go back and remember the places that we walked and the people that we converted. And I want you to go up onto the mountain because I'm going to give you a great vision of what I would have you go and do. They take the four-day walk there and he says, when I get there, I'm going to come and I'm going to meet you. And maybe Jesus is a little bit late, so, so the guys start fishing again. Which was really to represent them going back to their old lives. It's, they were met in Mark 1 there. He said, hey, come follow me, and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And as they fell away from God, they started to fish for fish again. Jesus meets them. He tells Peter, do you really love me? And we know that Peter gets restored there in John 21. He then tells them, go back to Jerusalem. So now it's another four-day walk back to Jerusalem. And they, you know, I mean, so at this point... She's been alive for about 10 days, and they've been walking for eight of them. And we're going to pick it up here in Acts 1 and verse 3. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Acts 1 verse 3, it says, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, I always find it interesting that this is a resurrected man here, and he's still hungry. He's eating with them. That's interesting. He gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said, it is not for you to know the times and days the Father has set by his own authority. But you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Then he, as he said this, he was taken up before the very eyes in a cloud and hidden from their sights. You know, there's an amazing account here written by Luke, who is a, a doctor, a very well-educated man. And he says, hey, this is how it went down. He appeared to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. That in fact he showed them that his wrist where he would have been crucified. He allowed them to touch the wound in his side. He showed them that he in fact was Jesus Christ. And he says this is what you got to do. Stay in Jerusalem. Power is coming. I mean they don't know what this power is. He says but power is coming to you. And he says just wait for there. John baptized with water, but now you're going to get this power. And then once you get this power, what you got to do is you got to preach to Jerusalem. You got to preach to Judea. Judea, you got to preach to Samaria. But you don't just stop there. You go to the ends of the earth. See, God wants his message not just to be here in San Francisco or be in the greater Bay Area or be in the United States. He wants his true gospel, the true message of Christianity to be preached to the entire globe. Amen. Amen. And this morning, I'm really defending the first gospel. What did he actually say? This is the first church service. So I think if we want to find out what actually was said, we should probably look at the first church service. That makes sense, right? I'm not a genius, but I think that's a good idea. What did they say? Let's pick it up in chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. The they would have been the 12 apostles now with Matthew replacing Judas. 
to really symbolize that there was 12 apostles and there was 12 tribes of Israel. Showing that this was going to be the new people of God. Verse 2, he says, Suddenly, the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, I don't know, but this sounds pretty powerful. I don't know if you've ever had a moment where you thought Jesus was coming back. You ever had one of those? I had it one time. I wasn't a disciple. I was working as a finance manager for Toyota in Long Beach. I was sitting at my desk and I was typing away. And I knew I wasn't with God. I wasn't a disciple and left God. And for some reason, the Air Force flew two like fighter jets right over the dealership. And it happened so quick. I was just typing. The next thing I heard was when the whole place shaked. I was like, oh my gosh, Jesus is coming back. I thought it for a split second. And I was like, oh, it was just fighter jets. But man, in that moment, I knew where I was at with God. And that was just a couple fighter jets. I think a violent wind from heaven would have been even more powerful and more startling than that. And here the place starts to shake. I can imagine going, I think this is what Jesus was talking about. And then they see a ball of fire. And the ball of fire represents the presence of God. When they follow in the desert to lead them where God would want them to go, they follow the ball of fire. And then that explodes. They go, oh my gosh. And then they start to speak in other languages. Have you ever spoken a language you never studied? Some of us don't know how to speak languages that we did study. <laughs> and here they're speaking all these different languages. I would say that this is safe to say that it's pretty powerful. Amen? This was the power that Jesus was talking about. Let's pick it up in verse 5. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard him speak his own native language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men speaking Galileans? How then is each of us here in speed of our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, visitors of Rome, Jews and both converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, what does this mean? Some of them made fun of them and said, they had too much wine. See, this just shows the spiritual state of Israel here. Here's the coming of the church, the fulfillment of the prophecies. And what do they think? Man, these people are drunk. They all, they've had too much to drink. Let's see what happens here next in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd of fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. No, it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days. God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. On your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. Here Peter says, guys, open your eyes. These people aren't drunk. It's only nine in the morning. That's just a good argument. Not that many people get drunk at night in the morning. But he says, this is what the Bible talks about. Joel talked about this. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now God is ushering in that new covenant, that new way that we can follow God, that new way where we can have a relationship with God. And I believe that, sadly, where the religious society was at in that day is very close to where our religious society is at today. You know, these... People had come for the day of Pentecost. They came to a meeting. And I think in the same way we've seen Christianity turned into a meeting. Why did they go? Because their parents went. And their parents went before them. And their parents went before them. In the same way we go to church because our parents went to church. And their parents went to church. And it's almost become a, a thing like our ethnicity passed down from our parents. Very few people know or even understand what God is trying to say to them. They couldn't tell you where they're at spiritually. They virtually have no convictions from the scriptures themselves. But they go to a meeting. In fact, when they start to hear the word of God, they think that that person must be crazy. They must be actually drunk because, man, that's not the socially accepted gospel that I was raised with. 
I think we're very much in the same place as these people here. What does Peter say to them? Let's get back to the scriptures. And that's what he does. Let's pick it up in verse 22. It says, men of Israel, listen to this. And I hope you're listening this morning. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to the cross, nailing him to it. But God raised him from the dead, freed him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold about on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also live in hope, because you have not abandoned me to the grave, nor have you let your Holy One see decay. You have filled me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried in his tomb is here to this day. That he was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he had placed one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. That he's not abandoned to the grave, nor his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all eyewitnesses of the fact. Exalt to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, which you now poured out, see and hear. For God had said, for God, for David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, Brothers, what do we got to do? I think we're going to find out what we got to do here. Peter replied, You've got to repent. You've got to be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far off for a Lord of God will call. That includes us this morning. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted the message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the number that day. We've got to slip into the sandals of these people here. And here, he preaches the gospel to them that we live in a time, what is the true gospel? What does it really mean to be a Christian? I mean, man, there's so many different denominations, 43,000 different denominations of Christianity. We are taught a whole array of things. It's so confusing. We don't know which way to go. This morning, we're going to answer those questions. Just much like he answered the questions for him here in the day of Pentecost. And this morning, we're going to come up with some very deep convictions from the Bible. Let's forget what Pastor Bob maybe told us. Let's forget what Mom and Dad maybe told us. Let's look at what the Bible actually teaches us here. We can't filter these things through emotions. We can't filter these things through what our parents taught us. We can't filter them through human reasoning. You know, in Acts 2, verse 16... He says to him, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Then in verse 25, he says, David said about him. Then he says in verse 34, for David did not accept in heaven. Yes, he said. What is he doing here? He's pulling him back to the Bible. Sadly, we live in a time where people go to church. Very few people have any idea what the Bible says. It's the same time that these people found themselves. He goes, guys, this is what David said. He wasn't talking about himself. His bones are still here. He was talking about Jesus. He raised the life. We saw it. We've got to get back to the scriptures. What does the Bible actually say? Well, let's look at what the Bible says about itself. Amen? Let's turn over here to 1 Timothy. First Timothy 4 and verse 15. It says, Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. Hear the Bible, the Word of God, the inspired Word of God is speaking to us. It says, hey, be diligent in this. Give yourself wholly to it so that everyone will see your progress. See, when somebody's really going after the Word of God, it's obvious. I'm sure it's been probably pretty obvious to those who know Christian this last week. Yeah. I'm sure it's been dramatic. Maybe even a little bit scary. 
because he's wholeheartedly going after what is the sound doctrine of the Bible and how do I make my life match it? And that's exactly what he says you have to go after. You've got to make your life match your doctrine. You've got to talk the talk and you've got to walk the walk. But here he says if somebody, hey, they just have a great life. You know, this person goes to church. They're a nice person. They're a good husband. They pay their taxes. They're nice to their dogs and kids and everything like that. But they don't have the sound doctrine of the Bible. Will that save them? Oh. Not at all from the, what the scripture says. Either the Bible's wrong or we are. Because this person could go to church, but if they don't actually live it, if their life doesn't match a doctrine, or if they don't have the right teachings, they could go to hell. We would believe this about other religions, but then we want to say anybody says the word Christian is okay. Here, let's, let's look at the other side of that coin. What if somebody knows all about the Bible and say, hey, this is Paul's epistle to Timothy, and Timothy was in Ephesus and was written about 63 AD. Oh, Paul, he's wonderful. But they don't do any of it. They're a, they're a Bible historian, but they don't do any of it. What is that going to do? Nothing. This is the responsibility of having the consciousness of God. There's something that separates us from animals. It's called moral law, consciousness. We could go against our instincts and desires, which animals live by, to do something that we know is consciously, morally right. And with that great consciousness comes responsibility, which is find out what God wants you to do and then do it. And if you do that, there's a great promise. You'll save yourself. And you also save your hearers. See, we live in a time where Christianity has been turned into philosophy. Well, if that's what it means to you, that's what it means to you. And how dare someone get up there on the stage and say that what's true to you is not true to you. That's true to you. But Christianity is not philosophy. And this isn't philosophy class. It's truth. Look here just a couple chapters before in 1 Timothy 2 verse 3. It says, this is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Christianity's truth is not subjected to how you feel about it. Just like math isn't. No matter how bad you may want one plus one to equal three, or you want, you know, you only got five dollars, but you wish it was ten, it's still five bucks. It does not matter. It's not subjected to how you feel about it. Christianity is about truth. And he says, you've got to find the truth, that true doctrine. What does the Bible actually say? And you've got to make your life match it. You know, in Hebrews 4.12, it says, the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing soul and spirit. The Bible compares itself to a sword. Why? Because it will flat cut you. It will cut you. There's people that are dead afraid of this thing right here. Because they know they open this up. Their life may be asked to do something different. Yeah. And they don't want to do that. There's certain countries that will let you get off the plane with a bat box of grenades, but not one of these things. Because they know that this can change somebody's heart. They can then go to their family, change their heart. They can go to their town, change their heart. They can go to their city, their country, this entire world. The Bible is the sharpest sword and it will cut you if you're willing to let it. What is that cutting? Jesus' brother talked about it. Let's go over to James 1. Oh, I mean, this is his bro. I think he knows a thing or two. It says in verse 19, James 1, verse 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. So I hope you're taking notes. Every one of you, so that means all of you, should be quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. See, that's always the good segue when you're about to really challenge somebody. He says, here guys, let me, let me give you a little prelude here. Be slow to speak. Quick to listen. That's why God gave you two ears and one mouth. And then don't get ticked off when you hear the word of God. Don't get angry about it. Because anger is not going to help you. Anybody can get angry. In fact, let's handle this in a spiritual way. What's a spiritual way? He says right here, 
Therefore, get rid of all moral filth. So all the religious pride. That's not what my daddy taught me. Well, where is that in the Bible? I don't know, but I believe it. Get rid of that moral filth. Let me tell you what. Religious pride killed Jesus Christ. The Jews just didn't like that message. That's not what we were taught. That's not what the commandments were. That's not what the Levitical law said. Oh, I don't like that. It's not what my dad taught me. Let's kill this guy. Get rid of that moral filth. And then he says what? The evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you if you're willing to let it cut you. And now let's see what it wants to say to us. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he'll be blessed in what he does. Wow. This is a pretty simple passage. It basically says, do the Bible. Don't just listen to it. You actually have to do this. Sadly, we live in a time where we've somehow got a doctrine where we don't have to do the scripture. Hey, all I got to do is believe. All I got to do is just be a nice person. I don't know what the Bible says. I don't really have to do it. That's like, you know, that's for other people who really, you know, maybe want to do that. I'm, that's not my gift. The whole obedience and know the Bible thing. That's not my gift. I have my other gifts in Jesus. So it's awesome that you, you got that gift. I think that's great. And I hope that you like do great things with it. But I'm cool. Are you sure your faith in people is like, I'm good with Jesus. Dude, there is no such thing as being good with Jesus, man. Even Jesus didn't say he was good. And here's a very simple message. Obey the Bible. You know, I've done Bible talks. I've asked people, who here grew up going to church? Raise your hand. Going to a, a church. All right, keep. Now keep your hand up if you feel like the people in that church actually obeyed the Bible. Oh my gosh. Everybody, except maybe one or two, put their hands down. How could this be? How could it be? How could it be that we went to church our whole lives, but pretty collectively believed that everybody did not obey this passage? In fact, there are the people that the passage is begging them to not deceive themselves. Many people are going to walk out of here today and go, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that that is over. Oh, what sports are on? Oh my gosh, how do I forget this? How do I get out of here? How do I get out of here? Gosh, I hate that person. Oh my gosh. You know, Winston Churchill said, most men occasionally stumble over the truth. They pick themselves up and carry on as though nothing ever happened. And here Jesus, his brother, is begging us. He's saying, don't think you can just listen to the Bible. He compares the stupidity of that as looking at your face in the mirror and merely going and forgetting what you look like. And all of us look pretty good this morning. I really want to give it up for you guys. look very nice. You look very nice. And I think you spent some time in the mirror to see how you're looking. Like I spent some time. I put on, you know, I, I ran out of shirts. So I wore my pink shirt with my pink shirt. And then I, I changed my pin. I put on the white one instead of the red one because I thought that that worked better with my little color scheme I got going on. I think, I think that I had it going on. And I think some of us, we look at ourselves in the mirror. We go, okay, we make sure that what we look like. And then we, we go, okay, I look good. And then we go to church. And you know what? But the Bible says... Doing that and going to church but not obeying the Bible would be like actually looking at your face in the mirror. And you got toothpaste on your face. You got snot in your nose. Your hair's all jacked up. Your shirt's wrinkled. You stink. You're all messed up. You're a hot mess. And then you go to church. And it's not like you go to church and you think you're a hot mess. You go to church and you think you look good. You're deceived. That's what the Bible says. It's like people who go to church and don't do what it says and somehow created a doctrine where they don't have to. Why is this so important? Why do we have to be so hardline about the Bible? Can't we just be like softliners? Can we be moderates? I mean, can't we just do some, find a middle ground somehow? Can we find a more socially accepted gospel? Where I can just not have to have deep convictions about anything. Why do we have to be like this? 
Well, let's let Jesus answer that question. Let's go to John 12. John 12 and verse 47. As for the person who hears my words, but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him on the last day. I take the same stance as Jesus Christ. I'm no better than anyone. People, oh, you guys are spiritual elitists because you call people to obey the Bible and you think you're better than people. No, we don't think we're better than anybody. I don't deserve to be here. I'm here purely by the grace of God. I'm here to save the world, not to condemn it. But there is a judge. And the last thing God would have us do is slap coexist bumper stickers on our car and join inner varsity and just act like everything's okay. And say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And say, hey, let's put our petty biblical convictions aside this morning and just come together in the name of being integrated together and not have to worry about what you actually believe in the Bible. Hey, if somebody says the word Jesus, isn't that just good enough? It's not good enough. Because here Jesus says, if you hear my words and don't do them, I don't judge you. But that very word will judge you. Where are the words of Jesus? Right here. So if I go, you know, I like this one where Jesus hangs with the kids because I like kids. And I want to have kids. And here where Jesus talks about, hey, love each other. I want to be loved. I like that. I want to fall in love. And I love the idea of love. But here he talks about, man, i got to actually give up things. i got to do this and do that. Unless a, a seed falls to the ground and dies, it bears no seeds. But if it dies, I don't like that. I don't want to obey that one. It says that very word will condemn you on the last day. Yeah. Right. See, the Bible takes an all or nothing approach. Right. It's either your standard or not at all. No but the worst thing to do is call yourself religious. What we've done right now is we've all agreed to play the same sport, which means the Bible is going to be our standard. Yeah. Let's just pretend for a little bit this morning, amuse me, that the Bible is our standard. And let's let the standard actually say what it means to be a true Christian, which is a mystery. Let's find the answer in the Bible and go right back to the day of Pentecost. Amen. Let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28 and verse 16. It says, The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. These are some of the records of Jesus' last words. He says, go back to Galilee. Go up on the mountain. I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. They come there, but they're still down. He goes, that's okay. I got all authority. I'm kind of God here. So here's what I want you to do. Go make disciples of all nations. And then once you've made a disciple, you baptize them. So who makes the disciple? Disciples. Sometimes you've got to read the Bible like you're a sixth grader. Yeah. Don't emotionalize it. Just what does it say? So he's talking to disciples. He says, go make disciples. So everybody needs to be made into a disciple. No one becomes a Christian just by walking down the street one day. And I just felt a moment in my heart. The wind hit my face at just the right angle. I felt God. And I think that I became a Christian that day. We've totally turned it into some mystical weirdness that has nothing to do with the Bible. Here he says, you need to actually be met by a Christian, a disciple. And then you need to be turned into a disciple by a disciple. And then after someone's been made into a disciple through the word of God by a disciple, what do you do to them? You baptize them. And then they need to be taught to obey everything. See, Jesus assumes when you first come into the church, you know nothing. And you need to be taught to obey everything. Here he says, go make disciples of where? 
all nations. So what if I just want to build a nice white church here in San Francisco with white people who are like me, who dress like me, and think like me, and like the same music I like, like the same movies I like? Am I doing this scripture? No. So do I don't have to obey Jesus? No, you have to obey Jesus. Look around. A church should be all nations. And not only that, a church should have a plan to go to all nations. We actually have a plan to do this. We're like, hey, we're not just going to build a church here. We're going to actually plant churches in Lagos. We're going to plant churches in Moscow. We're going to plant churches in Johannesburg. We're going to plant churches in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Mexico City, Sydney, Australia, Los Angeles, all over the world. We're going to actually do Matthew 28. Let me tell you, it's the most radical thing on the planet. It's hard. It'll cost you everything. It's why people don't really want to do it. Hey, Jason, what are you getting so excited about? I'm just a Christian. That's cool. I appreciate all these efforts. I'm just a Christian. I was raised this way. I was born it. Well, let's go over to Luke. I'm sorry, Acts 5, 11. Acts 11 and verse 25. It says... Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians. First at Antioch. Oh my gosh. The bubble just burst. The Bible says that a Christian is a disciple. So if I want to call myself a Christian... I have to call myself a disciple. People love the word Christian. Why? It's only in the Bible three times. We can really create whatever we want it to be. Now the word disciple is in the Bible 279 times in the New Testament. And it's very clear on what a disciple is. So this is a huge theological passage. Because I can walk down the street and ask 10 people, are you a Christian? And maybe this is San Francisco, it's pretty liberal. And maybe they would, six of them would go, yeah, I'm a Christian. And I'm going to get six different understandings of what that is. I was baptized. I did confirmation. I've read the Bible before. I went to Catholic school. My parents are Christians. Oh, yeah, my dad's a deacon. I'm going to get all different understandings of what that is. And I can ask them all, are you a disciple? And from my experience, virtually all of them will go, no, 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 I'm just a Christian. A disciple is kind of a higher thing. I'm not really that. I'm just a Christian here. But now we know that a Christian is a disciple, so we can biblically pull ourselves away from 2,000 years of false teachings and answer the mystery that was revealed there at Pentecost. What the heck is a true Christian biblically? And that's exactly what we're going to do from very clear passages. So if you're not a Christian... You're not a disciple, and if you're not a disciple, you're not a Christian biblically. I don't care what Pastor Bob or Mom or Dad or whoever told you. Those aren't the words of Jesus. Let's look at what the words of Jesus actually say. Turn over to Luke 9. I thought this was a birthday of the church, and I thought there was going to be cake, and I thought that it was going to be really joyous. It says here in Luke 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone, all right, so it's all there present, and anyone is everyone, that includes us. There's no plan B, there's no vegetarian option on this menu. Would be my disciple. He must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Oh my gosh. So you're telling me I have to do something? I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Here Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, it's not negotiable, deny yourself. Man, I kind of want to be in the kingdom and kind of like the world. I like having all my friends, and I want to keep all my friends everywhere. And I just, hey, I want to make the gospel attractive. That's why I go to the frat parties and this and that and not because I'm going there because, hey, I want to actually reach out to people. You're deceived. You've got to deny yourself. Let me tell you what, the world didn't like Jesus, and if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you're not going to be everybody's best friend anymore. He says, hey, if you're not willing to deny yourself, you can't be my disciple, period. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> Jesus is calling us to commitment, not sincerity. 
We live in a time where we've totally emotionalized the gospel. We've turned it into sincerity. Hey, just pray a prayer in your heart. Be sincere. Because God just wants a little piece of your life. He's just crying in heaven. and he wants a little baby piece of your life. And he doesn't really care. He's an American. He gets it. He gets that you're not committed. He gets that you're, you basically live the same way as the people in the world. But he just wants a little piece. And hey, if you just give him that, that's nice. And if you're sincere, geez, he's just flabbergasted by it. Here he's calling you to hardcore commitment. Anytime you enter great commitment, let me tell you what's coming. Self-denial. You want to lose some weight? Self-denial. You want to be great at basketball? Let me tell you what's coming. Self-denial. Marriage. Self-denial. Till death do us part. You know, a homegirl wants to talk to somebody over here? I'm married. That's it. I'm out. Get away from me. Jesus is saying, hey, you've got to follow me. And if you want to follow me, you've got to be committed to me to the point where you deny yourself. To the point of taking up your cross. Oh, well, I take up my cross. I have a cross. I have three of them. I have a gold one, a silver one, and then I have the one that's made of wood when I when I want to have the more earthy look. You know, when I, like a, I wear that one too when I got like my, my Timberlands on. I put on my wooden one. I got whatever. I, and of course, you know, man. It's not it's not what he's talking about. I'm sorry to, to disappoint you. He's talking about you got to be willing to go to a cross. Jesus was a revolutionary. Show me times when the world got changed without a revolution. Show me times when the world got changed without a movement. Anytime there's been significant change in the world, it came off of the backs of a revolutionary movement. And here Jesus is saying, I'm starting a revolution. You want to be a part of it? You may die. We understood that they, the apostles got this. What happened to them? Did they retire? Not at all. They all died. Most of them on crosses. What does he say to those? He says in verse 24, Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? See, we want all the life of Christianity. We want a white picket fence and a wife who will never go behind our back. We want to take our family to Walt Disney World every year. We want to go on cruises and we want to go to church and dress really nice and look really good. We want all the life. But no one wants to die. No one wants to actually die and lose their life. But you cannot have the life if you don't die. It's a mathematical impossibility. It's the life and doctrine thing. When you get the life and doctrine straight, you know what it feels like? Death. Anybody who comes up here and gets baptized, there's a very sober look on their face. Because they understand their life is ending. See, we're not looking to make members here. We only make disciples. And so Christian sat down. He's counted the cost. He's had to make decisions. Whatever had to change, he was going to change it. And he had to be willing to lose his life. Even himself, if he wanted to be a true disciple. Yeah. Come on. See, this is true Christianity. Let's look over here at Luke 14. Luke 14 and verse 25. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turned to them. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Oh, my gosh. Here he's got a large crowd traveling with him. The large crowd represents all the religious world that wants to be on the big bandwagon with Jesus. <clears throat> I'm just, I'm, it's a group on Christianity. I got it half price because a lot of people want it. I'm on the big bandwagon with Jesus Christ. And then Jesus turns around to them. He uses hyperbole to purposely boil down this group. He says, hey, let me tell you guys one thing. If you don't hate your father, mother, brother, sister, yes, even your own life, you just can't be a disciple. You know, I'm, not, I, I'm a pretty scholarly person. But I don't think you have to go into the Greek here to learn how to translate, if you don't, you cannot be. I don't think you need to like study coin Greek for that one. I think it's pretty simple. If you don't do this, you can't be a disciple. So can you call yourself a Christian? Not at all. But I don't care what you say. You don't care what Jesus says. 
Because here he says, if you don't do this, you can't be a disciple. I think a lot of those people left. You know, people have said, oh, if you, if you join them, become a disciple, oh, you, you know, you're not, they're going to pull you away from your parents. Jesus says you've got to put him first. We're disciples. We love everybody. We love everybody. We're not against anybody. I'm a doctor. All I want to do is heal patients. But I'm not going to get sentimental and change this and start having a 21st century Christian message like family first. It's not the message of Jesus. It's Jesus first. In fact, so much to where if they would try and compromise, it would seem like hatred to them because you'd be so uncompromising. You'd be unwilling to bend. You'd be a narrow path. You'd be an immovable rock of conviction. I think a lot of people left. What does he say to those who stayed? And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Martyrdom. You've got to be willing to die. Let's see what he says to those who even stayed now. 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost? See if he has enough money to complete it. For if he lays the foundation, is unable to finish it. Everyone who sees it ridiculed, saying this fellow began to build and was unable to finish. Okay, well, I became a disciple, and it was fun for like three months. And then I just, you know what? You know, I just feel like I'm not myself anymore. I feel like, you know, I just do these things. I get all these things. I'm not myself. Do you understand that's the whole point? You're not yourself anymore? Yourself is super messed up. Let me tell you, the acts of sinful nature are obvious. Yeah. We all are pretty jacked up people. Yeah. And the whole idea is that we die and now we actually become like Jesus. And say, hey, I don't want, I don't want to be committed because my heart's not in it. I feel like I'm being fake. No, it's called obedience. It's not about being fake. It's about obeying God. And when you just make a decision to obey, you know what happens? Your heart follows. And that's really love for Jesus. He says, this is love for me to obey my commands. He says, hey, if you start this and then you stop, everyone's going to ridicule saying, wow, what a joke. There was Matt talking about he's a disciple of Jesus, a part of the movement of God. They're playing churches all over the world. And he's ready to go anywhere, do anything, give up everything. And now he's back doing the same old stuff. I knew that there was no God. I knew they're all a bunch of hypocrites. And I, I believe in Darwinian evolution. And why is there such a rise in atheism? Why do so many people want nothing to do with Christianity? Because people never counted the cost in the first place. They said a little prayer in their heart. They had a little sincere moment. And some, some guy got up on a stage and told them it was okay. And they bought it hook, line, and sinker. And you know what? They're not victims. Because there's actually a Bible here. And he expects us to actually go back and find out what it says. It's the acid test to see who really wants to do it. God's not Superman. Jesus, and I, Jesus is not Superman. He just wants to see who's actually going to obey. He wants to see who's going to take the onus, the responsibility about themselves, and go back and say, wow, that's what the Bible actually says. Why does the church teach this? There must be something wrong with that. The Bible says this. The church teaches that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to follow the Bible. He expects us to actually do it. In verse 31, is it suppose the king is about to go to war against another king? Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men opposed one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he'll send a delegation while the others feel a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. What is he saying here? Well, he paints a very vivid picture. So you got an army over here of 20K, right? You got an army over here of 10,000. These two armies are going to war. He says, hey, this guy needs to come to a delegation before this guy gets there because he's going to destroy him. This is a parable, so everything has a meaning. The 20 is God. And let me tell you what, one day that army is going to come and judgment will be upon us. Yeah. This army is the you. The you is the people in the passage where he says, in the same way, any of you, it would have been whoever's left from the, the large crowd that was traveling Jesus. So it's those who need to become disciples, true Christians. It says the same way, any of you does not give up everything, can't be my disciples. So here's the reality of life that we have found ourselves in. I'm sorry if you don't like it. It's just the plight of your situation. God sent his prophets to us, one after another. And you know what happened? Our ancestors killed them. And then he sent his son Jesus to us. And you know what our ancestors did to him? We killed him too. And this is what he offers in this deal. Give 
up every thing. <laughs> Come on, bro. And that's the only deal you're ever going to get. Uh -huh. And so, so he goes, well, okay, wait, I, 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 I'm just an eight with God. I'm not a ten. I'm, not, I'm, a ten. I'm, a, I'm an eight. I'm like right here. If you're not with God, you're against God. Yeah. If you're not building the kingdom, you're tearing it down. And if you're not a true disciple, you're actually at war with God. Challenges our sentimentalities. We want to just believe that every grandma and puppy dog is going to be in heaven, but it's not the picture that the Bible paints. Yeah. And I'm sorry to tell it to you, but your problem is not with me, it's with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And you know what? This is actually a grace. People say, whoa, I'm, wait, wait, I'm saved by grace through faith. Faith alone, grace alone, faith alone, grace alone, faith alone, alone. Well, let's look at the only place in the Bible where the word faith and alone are in the Bible. Let's go over to James 2. James 2, verse 24. It says, You see that a man is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Wouldn't you have it? How can this be? One of the most popular, socially accepted doctrines of our day that, hey, you just need faith alone. The only time it's actually in the Bible, it says not before it. How can it be? Satan! There's a devil that leads the whole world astray. And people who just don't really want to know the message to begin with. I mean, it's right in the Bible. Not by faith alone. How could this happen? What is true faith? It says in John 14, verse 12. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. John 14, verse 12. It says, I tell you the truth, anyone, we already know that's everyone, who has faith in me, real faith, will do what I've been doing. He'll do even greater things than these. That's real faith. Jesus told us, if your faith produces anything other than a life like Jesus, what did Jesus do? He made disciples. He had a plan to evangelize the nations and the generation. In fact, the word disciple, what it just means is a learner, a student of a particular teacher. In our case, it's Jesus Christ. Here he says, if you don't live a life that's actually like Jesus, like a disciple, that's not real faith. See, what we've really bought into is that we don't know really what faith is biblically. You know, I've been reading this book right here called The New Testament Survey, and it says this. The second word believe is the key word in the gospel, occurring 98 times. It is customarily translated believe, through though sometimes it is rendered as trust or commit. It usually means acknowledgement of a personal claim or else a stand for the complete commitment of the individual to Christ. In it is the full meaning of the whole Christian life. For the tense of the verb used in this passage implies continual process of belief involving progress. So what does it mean? It means that the word believe is actually a verb. We use verbs all the time. And the Bible uses a verb. It uses it and it says believe. But the word believe actually encompasses the whole Christian process. So yeah, does the Bible say believe and you'll be saved? Absolutely. But it assumes that you're going to do this because the Bible actually said that too. Yeah, there it is. You can't just pick pieces and go, well, I like that. Jesus already said you can't accept some words and not the others. Yeah. It's a verb. It's like if I said, hey, who wants to go to lunch with me afterwards? I used a verb called lunch. And that, that, that meant that we're going to go. We're going to go find a restaurant, one that's affordable because we don't have that much money. Special missions, amen. And then we're going to eat. We're going to pay. We're going to be back by leaders. All of that is assumed in one word called lunch. Right? The Bible uses the same word faith, believe, in the same way. 
But we have people who don't really want to know what the Bible says, who want to take one word, one scripture, and make it their whole plan of salvation, and it's no plan of salvation at all. Well, you said I have to be baptized to be saved? Yes. What about the guy who's on the way to his baptism and he gets hit by a car? There's one principle that's taken out of that argument called God. God knows all people, whether they're actually going to be disciples or not, or actually repent. If somebody gets killed on the way to their baptism, they're not going to go to heaven. Don't try and confuse me with the humanistic argument like it says not to do in Colossians. Why do you have to be baptized? Well, let's look over here at 1 Peter. I think it's a valid question. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here it tells us how God looks at the world. He doesn't look down and go, oh, look at that denomination. They're like a 10 out of, you know, 8 out of 10. And they're 7s, they're 6s and all this gray area. He sees two types of people. People in the light and people in the darkness. People who are really his people and people who are not. People who have mercy and people who have no mercy. But we want uh, like shadows. Like I got a shadow here. I just want to live in the shadow. I'm somewhere in between these two people. You know, I've asked people many times, where do you think you're at with God? One to ten. What do you think the number one answer is? Seven. I'm better than average, but not quite there. It's a trick question. Because you're either with God or against God. But it tells us there's a definitive moment. It says once you were not a people, but now you are a people. So Peter automatically assumes that everybody at some point is in the darkness and they need to cross over. The question is, when do we do that? How do we cross over? How does it happen? Let's look here at Romans 6. So I told you this was more of a, a class than an actual sermon. So we're, we're just using a lot of Bible. It's a class. It says in Romans 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with them in baptism into his death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we'll also certainly be united with him like this in his resurrection. Jesus said you had to die to live. Where's the moment where that spiritual death happens? Because we know it's not a physical death for us. It's a spiritual death. Where does that happen? In the waters of baptism. We're all saved by the blood of Jesus. Every denominational person on the planet would agree with that. The question is, where do you meet the blood of Jesus? Because in the Old Testament, everybody had to actually get blood of calves and goats on them. And Moses would put blood on everything it talks about in Hebrews 9. Where do we meet the blood? Where we meet the blood where Jesus died and bled. And that's... In on the cross and we get buried with him in the waters of baptism. See, but we're not at anything alone. We're not at baptism alone. We're not to be a disciple alone. We're a Bible alone church. And here it says it's very clear. What is New Testament conversion? You need to hear the word of God. You need to believe the word of God. That belief needs to produce a life that is actually like Jesus. As Jesus said, true faith is. Then you need to repent and be a disciple because you have real faith, then you need to get baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. But it's the moment of baptism when all those things finally come to fruition. You meet the blood of Jesus Christ, you enter the light of God, your sins are forgiven, and you're in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Let's see if all these things happen. In Acts 2. Let's see if they all happen. Maybe there's a hole in my argument. Let's go here in Acts 2. Back to where we started. It says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, you've got to repent. You've got to get baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins. 
and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, your children, and for all, for all, for all, Lord God will call. With many other words, which we had many other words this morning. He warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted the message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Did they hear it? Absolutely. Did they believe it? Absolutely. They said, what are we going to do? Did they repent? 3,000 of them did. Did they get baptized? Those same 3,000. They did exactly what Jesus called them to do. The good news is step one is already done for you've heard. The question now is, are you really going to believe? It says in Hebrews 3, 15, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. And now I beg you and I plead with you, escape this corrupt generation in this religious world. Escape the sins that are destroying the world we live in. Just turn on the news. Escape the sin that wants to drag your own soul to hell. See, Pentecost, what it was, it was the celebration of the first fruits of the harvest. You know, in the Bible, it talks about that God is a, a farmer and he's sowing seed. He's sowing grain. And those who accept it will re reap a crop, a harvest. And here we see that Peter is sowing seed. He's sowing the word of God. And those 3,000 were the first fruits of the harvest of the birth of Christianity. And I believe that if we had actually just accept this for what it says... Make it our standard that you could be the fruit of the birthday of the church. You know, everyone here this morning is faced with the same decision that these people were faced with. You know, that even though that this is 2,000 years later, this is the birthday of Christianity. And you're either going to accept the message or you're going to hate the messenger. But if you hate it, your problem isn't with me. Your problem is with Jesus this morning. Your problem is with his words, not mine. And that's why Jesus, knowing that people would have a problem with his words, he ends out his Sermon on the Mount, the greatest lesson ever given, he ends it out like this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I pray this morning that you will escape this corrupt generation. The decision is yours, and to God be all the glory.